It's a great pleasure to introduce our luncheon speaker, Margaret Levy, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University, a senior fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment, co-director of the Stanford Ethics Society and Technology Hub, and the Jer L. Bacharach Professor Emerita of International Studies at the University of Washington. Formerly, she was the Sarah Miller McCune Director of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, <clears throat> where she remains as a faculty fellow. I feel connected to, to Margaret uh, as I worked in 6970 at CASPS, luckily in the cabin next to John Rawls. Uh, Margaret uh, earned her BA in political science from Bryn Mawr in 68 and her PhD in government from Harvard in 74. During these years, she had a strong interest in urban politics and was involved in the civil rights, anti-war, and women's movements. Graduating, she joined the faculty at the University of Washington, where she met and sometimes taught with uh, Nobel laureate in economics, Douglas North. <clears throat> An underlying question throughout her years of research is how to improve the quality of government. She has made groundbreaking contributions to the understanding of the bases for government legitimacy, the conditions for and sequence of, and sequence of trust and distrust, compliance and resistance, and individual versus collective action. How perfect for this afternoon's examination of the government. Professor Levy um, has um, authored and co-authored several books, including A Rule in Revenue, Consent, Dissent, and Patriotism, Analytic Narrative, Cooperation Without Trust, and in the interest of others. I give the floor to Professor Lin. Thank you, Ned. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here. I'm not between lunch and dessert, because there is no dessert. I guess I'm not dessert. Uh, and we'll see if that's true or not. Um, I am not, I would be, I'm a political scientist. I'm a professor of political science at Stanford. And one of the things that interests me is not just the economic side of what makes for a good society, but also the political piece of what makes for a good society. So for me, democracy and capitalism, which is the subject of today, are very intertwined. My priors are that you can't have a healthy democracy that produces mass flourishing, without a healthy democracy. So how do we achieve a healthy democracy? I've been looking at that question in a lot of ways that Ned has already mentioned. I do have some slides that we're just going to be illustrative, but oh, here's the thing. Um, but there's some other ways in which I've been investigating that question more recently that I'll draw on in my comments today. One is a program at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, which I directed the program as well as the center, on the moral political economy. What it means, how we create it, what it looked like in the past, what it looks like in the future. My understanding there and our understanding is that every political economy, every economy is a political economy, and every political economy has values and a morality. 
And the question is, what kind of moral political economy do we want to create for the future? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the one Adam Smith created, who gets called on a lot. I'm not going to cite Genesis today. Um, <laughs> several people have. Um, but we do need to think about what the moral political economy constitutes and what one should be in, a, in the next period of time. And this means thinking about the institutions that we need for the future, which ones need to change, which ones we keep. And thinking about the political and social, as well as the economic aspects of a moral political economy. And one of the things that we emphasize in this little book that uh, the co-director of this program, Federica Caracati, now at uh, King's London, and I emphasized was that we had to create institutions that helped to generate what we call, what I called with John Alquist, another co-author in the book In the Interest of Others, and an expanded and inclusive community of fate, F-A-T-E, not fate, fate. This gets beyond John Hyde's battle. I think we, can, we don't have to live with the battle that might well now be existing. But we can get beyond that. And I can cite instances, probably not in the talk, of how we have succeeded in that. So in thinking about democracy, we're thinking about how that fits with this new moral political economy. And that leads to the other work that I've been doing in collaboration with Tim Besley at LSE and Pablo Bermendi at Duke, um, which started as a paper for the Deaton Review, the Angus Deaton Review, on which is really about economic inequality. And we were asked to do something on political inequality. We wrote the paper. It's, it's available on the web. And what the paper did more than anything was make us realize that this was an under-theorized, under-conceptualized, and other under-measured subject. And that there were a lot of complexities we really had to understand. So we're now working on a book on that subject, which means that this talk will be a talk with a lot of loose threads because we've just really started on the book. And what I really invite you to do is in your questions and in our free time with each other, or email me. As you hear me talk, if this raises questions for you, ideas for you, thoughts of how we should proceed, we're really open to it, because we're at that moment when we're really trying to figure out how to do this right, um, or at least make some progress on it that then opens the space for an even better future work. OK, let me start with a graph. Um, so if you think of democracy as a set of institutions, is really very short-lived. I mean, it really only started at the beginning of the 19th century, right? Or in, in the beginning, or the middle of the, close to the middle of the 21st century now, at least in the first third of it. Um, and what we see in this graph, which is just a simple graph, which is just showing suffrage. And suffrage starts relatively low. And now, in almost everything that we might call a democracy, a problem in itself, what we call a democracy, but almost everything that we might call a democracy, suffrage, at least to jury, is 100%, or close to 100%. It's very high. Okay. So that particular part of democracy, that institution, at least the promise of real suffrage, has spread immensely. But this leads to a set of questions that suffrage doesn't get to. Because one, we know that suffrage, the vote, even though people legally have it, isn't in fact equally accessible. That there's voter suppression in the US and elsewhere. That there are all kinds of ways in which the political system is manipulated. So that even if you do have the vote, what does it mean? And how effective is it? What kind of influence does it actually express? So we decided to look at this question of democracy by thinking about a concept that is supposed to be, as it were, the structure on which democracy is based, creating a community of political equals. Now, that's different from economic equals, because they may not be economic equals. But are the institutions ensuring that everybody's voice is equally heard and everybody's capacity to be effective is more or less equally shared? So there's both a normative and an empirical question here. 
and our intention is to try to answer both. Normatively, we argue that or believe that political equality is an intrinsic good. It is part of what democracy is meant to be built on, but more importantly, to achieve. If we can adequately conceptualize political equality, we can begin to use it more effectively as a normative standard. So the link is very tight between the two. It's a normative standard, but if we don't understand it, we can't achieve it. If we can act, act but its conceptualization, conceptualization also allows us to measure it, how much of it is there, how, why does it, where does it vary, and then we can ask questions about why does it vary over time and across place. The conceptualization also will allow us to assess trade-offs. So I always go back to, not Genesis, but John Stuart Mill here, um, who's, who had a serious concern about voters, one that keeps coming up in various forms, you can hear different kinds of arguments about political equality and about democracy. That not all voters are equally informed, that not, not all voters equally care about the public good. So should everybody be given the vote? Shouldn't you have some test of political knowledge or political commitment or something before you get the vote? That was Mill's concern. I don't, I don't agree with him there. I agree with the question. It's an important question to ask about the trade-offs between political equality and other things. And there are other trade-offs. There's the trade-off, as we know, when you uh, grant certain kinds of rights and certain kinds of uh, equality that that might affect innovation, both capitalist innovation and governmental innovation, when you have more voices in the world and more equal equality of voices in the world. What does it do to the role of experts? What does that mean in all of that? And hierarchy, do those disappear from political equality? You've got to think about those kinds of things. Our argument, at least at the moment, this could all change as we do more empirical research, is that there are multiple equilibria of democracy and of political equality within democracy. And we have to identify several of those equilibria and figure out which one works for political context, political history, political cultures, and values of the current time and place. So let me give you some additional preliminary provisos emphases. The approach to economic equality, to economic equality, is generally distributional. Who has more or less? And that was certainly the focus of the Deaton Review. The approach to political equality has also sometimes been largely distributional. Who has more or less political power? And distributions of income, wealth, and political influence certainly affect political equality. Um, this is turn out here. This is, uh, these are graphs of political equality and um, economic vote by the suffrage and by participation in, in voting, and economic equality by some standard measures. And you can see, even visually in this not so great graph, that they are fairly correlated with each other. So we know that there is some, and, and for lots of other reasons, we know obviously that distributional factors, particularly economic factors and political factors, can affect political equality. But what we want to do, sorry, I lost my place. But what we want to do is to argue that it cannot be reduced to those factors. It's not just a distributional problem. It's also, political equality is, instanti is instantiated in social relations and interactions. I'm going to quote one of the Deaton Review papers by Deborah Satz and lots of first name White. Um, that political equality is, in, that what we're looking at when we're looking at democracy and equality is that it is instantiated in social relations and interactions. A society enjoys equality when its social relations are free of unaccountable power, stigma, or graveling. So we're going to look at social relations as well as the distributional factors. We also, as I said, want to claim that political equality is an intrinsic value, that good, valuable in its own right, that it may have instrumental value, 
but it's still a bubble unto itself. So how do we define it? Now let's get to the guts here. Um, we're going to start with some very classic political scientists, political theorists, Robert Dahl and Sidney Verba. Dahl, they both argue that the, the starting place is equal consideration. And for, by that, they mostly mean looking at various forms of participation. We're going to go beyond participation. Dahl says, in cases of binding collective decision, to be considered as an equal is to have one's interests taken equally into consideration by the process of decision making. One person, one vote. Verba says, voices are equally expressed and given an equal hearing. This is all very fine language, but we're going to have to get into how you actually make that happen. But we also want to argue that we want to bring in some notions that come from political philosophy and political theory. Notions of capabilities and relational equality from people like Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum, from people like Elizabeth Anderson, who's doing some amazing work on relational equality right now. I've already mentioned Deborah Sachs's work. Danielle Allen's work on difference without domination, she's about to come out with an incredibly great book on democracy and how to think about that. So we need to think about the concepts that they bring to bear in all that, talk and talk about them and bring them into the discussion. And to do that, to, to pay attention to Dahl and Verba and equal consideration, and to pay attention to what these political philosophers are really making us think of, we have to emphasize processes, the processes and practices that facilitate equal consideration. So what are the processes that matter? How do we assess where, whether there is equal consideration in practice? And that is not a straightforward problem. Here we focus on three dimensions of what we see as the concept. Participation, representation, and responsiveness. Most of the research has been on participation. I showed you figure one about the turnout. Look at that. This is a figure. Uh, that was the first figure I showed you. This one was about the granting of suffrage. This is about turnout over the period between 1900 and 2000. And you can see that in a variety of democracies that are referenced here, it went up, and then it's going down. So these things aren't stable either. I mean, we have to figure out each period just how to correct them, how to make sure that they actually exist, and how to measure them. But most of the research has been on these kinds of questions. Is there suffrage? How much turnout is there? And other forms of participation, like organizations, lobbying groups, uh, to some extent mobilization. I have an argument, for example, on unions, that the decline of unions in the United States has been disastrous for the polity because the unions, one, were an important lobbying group for certain interests that are now badly underrepresented, and they were also a voice that created a kind of civic culture and kept certain kinds of extreme opinions that may exist among some of the members of the union under control. That was not allowed in a civil society or civic culture. So the loss of unions has meant a real decline in both political equality, political responsiveness, representation, but also the civic culture. Um, and I think we also need to link this even more than we have already, Ned, to your argument about participation and your discussion of mass flourishing. So we will be doing that. Being here has been an important reminder of that, so thank you. The second form that we look at is representation, which is also important. So do we only go by descriptive representation? If we do that, clearly very few democracies are representative. Um, almost all democracies, most legislature, legislators, are white male and lawyers, or rich in some, from some other form. That's not exactly descriptive representation of the population as a whole. But there's another question there. Even if they look like that, and let's hope they don't always look like that, um, there is still the question, are they really representing their populations? You can do that 
whatever position you're in. You don't have to be looking like the person you're representing. But do we have mechanisms that really allow people to represent, and are they taking advantage of that and doing that? And I have to say, this area, there is research on this area, but it's mostly on descriptive representation. It's really very much at the beginning and pretty unsophisticated about other ways in which representation could be expressed and is actually happening. So that's one of the areas where we really have to delve more deep. And finally, the hardest one of all is political responsiveness. So even if you have representation, and even if it's really representing you, even if you're participating, does the society get what it needs and wants to encourage mass flourishing? Is it really, it, is the system really responsive? There's lots of evidence right now in many democracies, I'm looking at Diana and coming from Britain, um, so it's not just a US problem, and we know all over the world there are many examples where the governments and the people do not seem to be on the same page at all. And certainly groups of the people are not on the same page. The battle problem that John was raising, which is, again, not just an American problem. The, the multiples, the plurality of people who we now believe should be represented in a democracy and should be responded to, we do not have mechanisms for doing that. Almost all democracies of the older ones, anyway, started in a period where who they had to be responsive to was a very small subset of the population. Now, it's a, a plurality and with very different characteristics, and we do not have the institutions or the mechanisms to do that properly. So that's our next problem. Okay, I also, yes, I taught with Doug North for a long time. I, I think I was an institutionalist even before I met him, but I certainly got confirmed in that stance um, in teaching with him for 10 years and running a political economy program with him. So we can't talk about any of this without talking about institutions. Because even if you set up all these processes, they still need guardrails. Diana and I were sitting next to each other in the discussion, and we were thinking about the role of regulations in several of the discussions that went on today, and how important regulations are. But just having the regulations isn't enough. There has to be enforcement of those regulations. There has to be a culture of compliance with those regulations, which is fed by creating a trustworthy government and other things. So how do we really think about the kinds of institutional arrangements that will provide those kinds of guardrails, that will make sure that democracy, the representatives, the legislators continue to be responsible? We need norms that guide, that, which are kind of informal institution, that guide behavior of elected officials, judges, bureaucrats. We need to think about the extent to which government officials are perceived as trustworthy. Um, we do not have to rely on their personal motivation. You mentioned the book, Cooperation Without Trust. A lot of what we argue, uh, Russell Hart and Karen Cook and I argue in that book, is that you set up arrangements so that you can ensure that organizational actors, government actors, are in fact going to act in a way that their incentives are aligned with the interests of those that they are supposed to serve, so that you don't have to rely on their personal motivation to rely more on the institutions and assess the trustworthiness of the institutional arrangements. But even if we do all that, we may get a kind of uh, Weberian world, a form of equality of, tr of treatment in the bureaucracy that's dispassionate and goes by the rules, but that's not always the best or most responsive way for bureaucracy to behave. Here I'm thinking about the wonderful work of Hillary Cotta. Um, about transforming the welfare system in Britain and really thinking about what a family needs as a unit or even an individual need so that you don't have 14 different people coming in for each piece of the dysfunction of a particular family or person. Someone dealing with the truancy, someone dealing with the mental problems, someone dealing with the addiction, someone else, and they're not talking to each other, coordinating or really helping the person involved, though they may all be dispassionate. So we may, or, and they may even be a credit, but we need to really think about how these systems are organized so that they really respond to the people they're supposed to respond to. So we're back to the role of relations 
transactions. We also have to think, I told you this talk would be a little disjointed. We also have to think hard about political power. This is what I, my, I was raised on as an undergraduate. I was a student of someone named Peter Backrack, a name that may be familiar to a few of you still, but created the second face of power. There were three faces of power. Um, Dolls was the first, and Steve Luke's still with us, is, was the third. So I'm going to emphasize that there are two faces to the faces. Um, one is compatible with political equality, and the other undermines it. Accountable authority granted through democratic processes is an acceptable form of power. The that can be hierarchical. The establishment of hierarchical power and legal coercion are inherent features of a representative system an accountable bureaucracy operating within and upholding the rule of law. The other face, and to be avoided, is government that serves those with sources and forms of influence that should be made irrelevant within democracies. Disproportionate influence over policy outcomes that are the result of advantages bestowed by money or position or superior technology that distorts participation, representation, and responsiveness are not compatible with political equality or with power rightfully used. But they are forms of power. Democracies in principle are designed to counter such anti-democratic influences. When they do not, the effect is to reveal how unfair government procedures and processes are and thus undermine the trustworthiness of government itself. Many scholars today, I won't cite them all, link the decline in participation with the decline in trust in government. As I've shown, when confidence in government declines, so does willing compliance with its demands and laws. And we see all kinds of problems that result from that. So power contributes to undermining confidence by re revealing underlying unfairness, which is a critical piece of trustworthiness. So part of our project in writing this book will be re to revive and revitalize the kinds of power that were the discussions of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, sort of died out in the 80s because of measurement problems, really. And we want to rethink that set of issues to think about how you can conceptualize power and measure it so we can understand its relationship with political equality. So the first kind of power is coercion. And we're going to also have three kinds. The first is coercion. And it can be, as I said, legitimate in the Weberian sense, ensuring that the de delegated authorities have the means to enforce the laws according to the prevailing rules and norms. But it can also be democratically problematic. Private individuals and groups taking the laws into their own hands special interests, undemocratically capturing part of the apparatus of the state to impose their ideas of migration, labor, racial, or religious orders. Second kind of power is agenda setting. Under democratic and constitutional constraints, we want to have some people to have some hierarchical power. We have a representative set democracies in most countries not direct democracy, not fully participatory democracy. We want people to have delegated responsibility to figure out the laws, to gather the expertise that is needed, to think about the problems, um, so that it's respect, responsive to public votes, demands, and pressures, but done it in a way that is really taking the whole and the public good into account. Lobbying is not out of the question, but it is regulated, so it doesn't lead to ex extraordinary influence. But then there can be agenda setting, which is problematic for democracy and represents the, the unequal distribution of power and resources that should be kept out of the system. Buying votes and influence through campaign finance of the kind that we have in the US, for example. Um, demagogues non-democratic rules that block votes and voices and distort representation. 
social media, but I'm going to come back to that. The hardest one we're calling mindset, rather than hegemony or ideology. So ways in which people think about the world and the world that they're in and how they understand it. We do want to, following Sid Verba and others, create a civic culture that recognizes the plurality of voices and the legitimacy of difference. But we don't want brainwashing, the Facebook kind, the Twitter kind, the kind of manipulation that of our approaches, of our information, of our thinking that has become so problematic today, as John has pointed out. We don't want unfounded conspiracy theories. Um, we don't want biases that inhibit cap capacities and capabilities and make it hard to really achieve what you could and undermine meaning meaningful autonomy. So what we hope to show as we proceed in this book is that political equality is a worthy ideal and, and intrinsic good, and it absolutely has to be part of democracy, that it's a basis for democracy, and an outcome of democracy. So it supports democracy, but also is created by democratic rules. We can measure aspects of it and assess how well we are doing and what the various forms of it might look like. So we have multiple models, not just one. But we also have to recognize that there are always trade-offs. More political equality means more voices, which means morality and wisdom of the crowds, but also more contestation, even polarization, and an intensification of uneven preparation for the vote or for expertise. We cannot ever assure that all will use their voices equally, even where voting is compulsory. But we can try to ensure that everyone has the right and capability and possibility to express their voice should they choose to. And that their concerns are taken into account even if they don't actively express their voice. That's what we hope to find. But we may learn that political equality is a nearly impossible goal or undermines rather than supports Republican forms of democracy, and we might find something even more surprising. But whatever we find, the effect will, we hope, make government processes more participatory, representative, and responsive. Thank you. I think we may just have time for like one question. One question. Someone wants to ask a good one. Lizzie, you better call a question. I don't want to show. Who wants bias. to be the one question? Um, thank you. That was a <clears throat> wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, as you go forward. Uh, Could you introduce yourself? Sorry. Sure. Um, I'm Catherine's dad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, I, did, I was an economics major in college, but I'm, I'm a lawyer. Uh, well, but I'm not rich. So is my husband. Oh, okay. Um, you, you mentioned uh, right at the beginning, one person, one vote um, is, is the basis of political equality. And uh, as you go forward, in your uh, in doing this book, I would suggest two areas to, uh, to focus on, uh, just from my own experience, uh, and that is one uh, gerrymandering. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you know the the the, the law the cases that have come down yep. have basically said it's legal, uh, and um, in the U.S. in the U.S. <laughs> and we have representatives choosing their voters instead of the voters choosing the representatives. Um, and I would think that that would be a real Absolutely. fertile area. The other uh, is uh, one that, again, is very topical, and that's um, police relations. Um, and in terms of the governance of police uh, and civilian um, input or oversight uh, and finding political equality, because as you said, uh, the legitimacy of their authority, of their power, um, really has to be something that people believe in to follow the laws. 
And uh, I think that's another area that your research could be very helpful in, uh, particularly as we have more and more consent decrees going forward in saying what local police departments should look like uh, to have political equality. And believe it or not, that's probably the basis for decreasing crime uh, in America is having more faith in police, more legitimacy, more political equality. Thank you very much. Do I have time to say anything in response to <laughs> Making sure, don't violate the rules here, compliant. Um, yes, thank you for those excellent suggestions. Um, to reassure you, uh, Pablo Bermendi, one of the co-authors, is a political geographer who has done a lot of work on the geographical bases of uh, political access. And we're certainly very alert. Uh, there are a whole list of things I could have named that are violations of political equality. And we're going to have to make some tough decisions about which ones we spend some serious time on. Let me just add one other thing about the book. It's going to basically, we, we created a scope condition around democracies that have some history of relative stability. Mostly they're in capitalist, they're all in capitalist countries, so these are capitalist democracies. Um, and we're also going to be doing a series of vignettes from about 10 different countries that represent a range of democracies and include places probably like Brazil and India and some other places around the world from different parts of the world, as well as the U.S. and the European countries with their advanced democracies. So we will be using vignettes to illustrate ways in which things, practices have been problematic or good in those different or bad in um, those different countries as a way to sort of get at some of these kinds of questions that we may not be able to address systematically. On the issue of uh, police, policing and crime, that's a really important question about the trustworthiness of government and one that I've, I and many others, as you well know, I'm sure, have explored. And that will certainly come into play and it's a form of the question of what kinds of authority um, and what kinds of power are legitimate and, and appropriate within a democracy and which ones aren't and how to ensure that even something like policing, which is put in place for some very good reasons and needs to exist, um, how you make sure that it's accountable and appropriately responsive. So I think those are really, just keep reminding us of those things. So we either address them or make a list of things at the end that somebody else better address because we just couldn't get to it. Hey, Rubez from Global Reach. I have a rather basic question, which is how do we ensure that US democracy lasts long enough for your book to come out? <laughs> I mean, it's a fairly serious question. No, I, I hear you. But we, Carly, how do we amp up participation in the near future? Well, it's, yes, I think that's a very serious, frightening question. Um, it's not just a question of amping up participation, it's ensuring that those who want to participate can, and not just that some of them can. So, and that gets back a little bit to the question of gerrymandering and who's being enabled and who hasn't been enabled. We are not going to solve that by November. Um, so this election, I mean, we can pour money into helping the vote get turned out and these rules that are blocking people be challenged. Um, we can pour money into that. And there's some very, as we know, sophisticated players in the game now. Some well-known like Stacey Abrams who are fighting it, but some not so well-known. There are a lot of organizations out there, as you must know, that are doing some amazingly good work that is really evidence-based, that is really trying to figure out where it makes a difference to put money and to put energy and how to do that. I mean, we're using the best of social science tools, finally, to really think about electoral strategies. So, I mean, I, this conference has um, revealed both uh, dystopian visions of the future and some mildly optimistic visions of the future. I'm of the mildly optimistic view. 
I mean, if you look at the long array, which isn't that long, as I mentioned, of democracy, even the American US democracy, this is hardly the first time we've had serious polarization. We did have a civil war. We did have McCarthyism. John said he grew up under the shadow of the Cold War. I grew up under the shadow of McCarthyism before, first, uh, before the Cold War. I mean, it was tied up with the Cold War, obviously, but it was a whole other threat in and of itself if you lived through it, as some of us did. Um, so, you know, this is not the first time the country has, has faced that kind of threat. I'm mildly optimistic that we find our way through this. Um, we're beginning to see indications that people are mobilizing, that people are raising questions, that there's challenges going on. I mean, even the Supreme Court seems to be questioning its stances now, which is remarkable to me. I, I'll believe it when I see it. But, you know, there is, a, there is something in the air. So I think we just have to help those tides along. Um, I wish I could say more. I wish I had an answer that was clear and definitive. I think that, you know, if, if democracy dies before the book will come out, I suspect we'll still get, in the U.S., I suspect we'll still get the book out in Australia or something. <laughs> so the book will come out. All right. Well, thank you very much, Margaret.